numerous potential and possibilities, discussions with fascinating people, designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome everybody again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Christoph Koch, Chief Scientist of the MindScope Program at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, originally funded uh, by an amazing $500 million donation by Microsoft founder Paul Allen, uh, with his bachelor's and master's in physics from University of Tübingen in Germany, his PhD from uh, the Max Planck Institute for Biologic Cybernetics. Dr. Koch spent four years as a postdoc fellow in the Artificial Intelligence Lab and Brain Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT in the, from 1987 to 2013. Uh, was a professor at Caltech uh, from his initial appointment uh, as assistant professor at the Division of Biology and uh, Engineering and Applied Sciences to his final position, uh, Lois and Victor Trundle Professor in Cognitive and Behavioral Biology. Uh, Dr. Koch joined the Allen Institute for Brain Science as the Chief Science Officer in 2011, became its president in 2015. And uh, Dr. Koch's passions are neurons, or what he refers to as the atoms of perception, memory, behavior, and consciousness, uh, including all their diverse shapes, behaviors, computational functions, and the mammalian brain, primarily the neocortex. And he leads the Allen Institute's efforts to identify all the different types of neurons in the brains of mice and humans, uh, known as their cell census effort. Uh, Dr. Koch's writings uh, and interest integrate theoretical, computational, experimental neuroscience, uh, philosophy, and contemporary trends, including artificial intelligence, and he's co-authored more than 300 scientific papers and multiple books, uh, including The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Everywhere But Can't Be Computed, which we'll be discussing today, uh, along with Consciousness, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist, The Quest for Consciousness, The Biophysics of Computation, uh, and Methods in Neuronal Modeling from Ions to Networks. A lot to talk about today, but Dr. Christoph Koch, welcome to the show. Wow, well, that leaves me breathless. Thank you. <laughs> Christoph, it's, it's great having you. Um, if I could start off just by reading a, a little bit from your, uh, your opening chapter in the book. Um, I wake up every day to a world suffused with conscious experience. Uh, as a rational being, I seek to explain the nature of this luminous feeling, who has it and who doesn't, how it arises out of physics in my body, and whether engineered systems can have it. Uh, just because it's more Difficult to define conscious disobjectively than to define electron, a gene, or a black hole. Doesn't mean that I have to abandon the quest for a science of consciousness. I just have to work a lot harder at it. Uh, talk about when your first interest arose, as you put it, from transitioning from physics to understanding feelings, if you would. It was a long time ago, and I had toothache. And I was lying there at night, I couldn't sleep because my molar was pounding away. And then you think, well, why does it hurt? You know, it's pretty bad and it hurts. Well, it hurts because, you know, we know there's electrical activity that originates in the pulse, that goes down into the trigeminous nerve, that goes here, goes into a switch back into, uh, into the spinal cord, goes up through the thalamus and into cortex and gives rise to electrical activity in some neurons, which ultimately mean there's some ions that slosh around, sodium, potassium, calcium ions. So what? I mean, why should they hurt? And, 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 and neurons sort of a centimeter away, you know, if they fire, they give rise to pleasure or they give rise to a voice in my head or anything else. And, and then you really, then suddenly comes to you, there's a complete, and disconnect. On the one hand, we have the physics and the neuroscience of the brain, you know, which ultimately involves physical things happening, electrical fields, you know, switching, channels opening and closing, ions moving in and out. But, but, but that's all physics. We understand that at least in principle. On the other hand, we have feelings. And we know those feelings are closely linked to this organ, you know, unlike the ancient who believed that it was in the heart, we know it's in the brain, but, but the exact relationship is totally mysterious. But that's really when it, when it hit me when with pain. But this applies to any other conscious percept. And that's been my life pursuit to try mm -hmm. to understand the sort of this lawful relationship between the, the physics or the, the, the biophysics of the brain and feelings. Because it's not in, in the foundational equation of physics. It's not in quantum mechanics. It's not in relativity theories. It's not in the periodic table. It's not in our genes. 
it seemingly doesn't seem to be in our genes. They specify, you know, uh, genes and, and proteins. But again, where is consciousness? So that's mm -hmm. been the, the, the quest. And about a quarter of the way down uh, chapter one, you know, you, you broadly define consciousness as experience and very elegant and concise. Uh, and then a couple chapters later in, in, in chapter eight, and we'll get back to what comes before that, but you introduce readers to integrative information theory, uh, your work with uh, Dr. Tononi, and you, you state, uh, it does not attempt to squeeze the juice of consciousness out of the brain, but rather start with experience itself and ask how must matter be constructed to support this particular mental experience. Um, I know you give entire lectures on this subject, but if you could for a few minutes, just take us on a short walk through integrated information theory and the principle uh, of irreducible cause and effect power. Yeah, so first of all, what I and many people try to do, so I first worked with Francis Crick, who, you know, co-discovered the, the, the DNA, the structure of the DNA molecule. Sure. And he and I wrote many papers on, on consciousness and its neural footprints, the so-called neural colleagues of consciousness. And we hypothesized way back in 1989 that that a, a buzzing, a frequency, of a 40 hertz gamma oscillation uh, of neurons where they fire periodically, rhythmically, could be the, the correlate. But then you, you, you say, well, why 40 hertz? Why not 30 hertz? Or why not 50 hertz? Or why any frequency? Or if you say those neurons are critically involved, well, why not those neurons? Right? Mm -hmm. And so this is what I mean. What, what people like me and others have tried to do, they try to take the brain and squeeze really hard and say, ah, what comes out is 40 hertz, so that must be consciousness, or whatever other hypothesis. And this, as the, as, um, the American Australian philosopher David Chalmers says, this is really the hard problem. Right. You, 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 you cannot go from sort, sort of the physics of the brain to say, well, because of this particular physics, and even if you involve quantum mechanics, it's still deeply material. Well, why quantum mechanics? And what quantum mechanical effect is relevant? And why this particular quantum mechanical effect and not that uh, quantum mechanical um, effect? So you really have to start the other way. You have to start with consciousness. So in a sense, it's a little bit like idealism. You start with the only thing that I am deeply acquainted with. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't have direct knowledge of atoms, of electrons, of viruses, of even my own brain. The only thing I know for certain, I can see, I can hear, I can feel, I can have pain, I can be in love, etc. Right. So this is ultimately going back to René Descartes. The only way I know that anything exists, including myself, is because uh, because I'm conscious. That's the one thing I can say for certain. And so this, this, um, this theory, so-called integrated information theory of consciousness, abbreviated IIT, as you said, starts out with phenomenology. It starts out, how, do, how does any feeling, what, what, uh, what properties are true for any feeling? Well, they exist for themselves. They don't exist for you. They don't exist for my parents or for mm -hmm. God or for anyone else. They exist for me. They, they, uh, they're structured. When I look at you, there's left, there's right, there's up, there's down, there's distance, there's close by, there's farther away. So any experience is structured. It's differentiated. It's one out of infinite many. Um, it's, it's integrated. It's one experience. I don't see you and as, as simultaneously there's a, sort of um, another conscious experience of the background behind my, in my Zoom terminal. Mm -hmm. There's only one experience of which you are part of. Um, and, it, uh, and it's definite. There are certain things that are part of this experience and most other things that aren't part of this experience. And then the, the theory says, well, let's look for a mechanism, for some physical mechanism like an iPhone or a neural network or anything else that sort of shares these five properties. And it starts, the, the theory, which is very uncommon in science, starts with making some assertion what exists. So it starts with ontology you know, the philosophical study of what exists, ontos. And the theory says, well, what exists is ultimately things that have causal power. This goes back to Plato. I know gravity, I know the moon exists because it exerts causal power on us, right? It makes the tides uh, move. Uh, a move, you know, um, electric field that exists because it exerts an, an, an effect on, on charged particles. So ultimately what exists has to have causal power. And the theory says, well, if a system exerts causal power on itself, that means it's in a particular state and it can determine sort of its future depending on, on its state. And also it, it comes from a, um, from a state, you know, so in the past it was at a particular state, it goes into a particular state, and now in this current state it can go to many different possible future states. 
This is intrinsic power. This is causal power of the system that it has to just sort of to determine its own fate. And that's really what consciousness is. So it's um, it says ultimately consciousness in any system, whether it's biologically evolved or artificially engineered or designed, or even non-evolved physical system like the sun, et cetera, or the you know, planet Earth in principle is conscious to the extent it has internal causal power. The more internal causal power it has upon itself, the more it is conscious in a spe very specific measurable way. So it has this number called phi, mm -hmm. it's, it's a pure number, it's not measured in bits, it can be zero, then strictly speaking, the system has no causal power itself. It, it doesn't properly speaking exist as a system. It does not exist as a system. Only systems that are phi, that this number bigger than zero exist for themselves. The bigger this phi, the more, the more irreducible they are, the more they exist for themselves, the more, the more conscious they are. And so in principle, if you provide me a description of a system, any physical system, in principle, I can measure how mm -hmm. conscious it is, and I can build conscious meters, and people are trying to do that uh, for clinical practice to tell me whether this patient who's, let's say, maybe, you know, because he was in a bad uh, car accident or, you know, she had a stroke, uh, unable to speak, but I can now determine whether there's someone actually home, whether there is something to feel like that patient in that particular state. Mm -hmm. And Shifting a couple chapters further, and we'll come back to, to cause and effect power in a bit, but uh, in your chapter 11, which is entitled, Does Consciousness Have a Purpose? Um, you point out that, uh, as you say, most of the ebb and flow of life occurs beyond the pale of consciousness in, in the unconscious realm. Uh, and then you introduce the reader to this uh, intelligence consciousness plane. Uh, and coming back to IIT, you mentioned the degree of integrated information that an organism may possess ultimately is a reflection of uh, complexity, enrichment of the environment that they ultimately adapt to and, and we're constantly responding and, and changing uh, based on that environment. Um, I, I was wondering though, you know, it, the, but other areas of conscious awareness or consciousness that, you know, you've pointed out, you know, we, we're conscious when we're dreaming. Um, another form of consciousness which is kind of interesting to me is that of delirium where, you know, you could be conscious but sort of unaware of yourself. Um, when, when, you're, when you're looking at consciousness from some of these altered states, <laughs> what are the purposes, in, in your opinion, of, of some of those uh, compared to uh, what you mentioned earlier in the chapter? In, some, in a strict sense, consciousness has no function. What I mean by that, just like no physicist would ask, what's the function of electric charge? Mm -hmm. like we live in a universe that has that has charged particles. Yeah. Now, evolution has exploited that, has exploited the separation of charges, let's say inside the cell and outside the cell to make life. But charge itself doesn't have any function. Same thing, consciousness. Consciousness is a physical aspect. It's really, a, it's ultimately a structure. Mm. It's a structure in, in, in a physical system. It doesn't have a function. Now, we have very large brains, and much of what we do is correlated, is commingled with, with consciousness. And in that sense, intelligence is commingled, insight, creativity is commingled with, but um, is commingled with consciousness or can be commingled with consciousness. But conceptually, we really have to separate them. Intelligence, whether natural or artificial, is ultimately about doing. Mm. But you have to do something on the short term, the medium term, and the long term. And you can plan, which is also ultimately about doing. Right? Consciousness ultimately is not about doing, it's, it's, just, it's, it's about being. It's a state of being. Mm. When you're in delirium, when you're taking, you know, 5-MeO or psilocybin, when you're in love, ultimately those are different states of being. Now, they can sometimes lead to behavior, but not always. In dream, mm -hmm. they don't lead to behavior. When you're doing a pure, uh, you know, a, med um, a meditation exercise, when you're pure experience, you're not doing anything. When you're taking certain types of drug, you're not doing anything. So uh, on the other hand, when you're in a state of flow where you also have very much reduced self, you're very active, right? You can be climbing or rowing or running when you're in this sort of the state of flow, which is very benign, but, but consciousness in general does, does not have a function in a strict sense. Got it, Got it. I appreciate that. Um, your article in Scientific American 
uh, December 2019, crashed among the machines. Uh, within our lifetimes, computers could approach human level intelligence, but will they be able to consciously experience the world? Um, chapter 13 of your book is entitled Why Computers Can't Experience. And here again, you bring back a real extrinsic causal power, this ability of uh, one to influence oneself. Um, it's something that, as you say, in, you know, a computer and the current architectures will uh, not be able to simulate. Um, and you, you have the examples of things like Einstein field equations and, and hurricane simulations and so forth, which do not yield black holes and storms inside our computers. Uh, but you do mention that potentially someday, uh, things like neuromorphic computing, uh, which is this rather futuristic concept of, uh, of computers that spike like neurons and send signals downstream to other neurons and so forth, whether that happens in 2200 or whenever, uh, may bring some you know, uniqueness to uh, what's going on inside uh, Silicon. Um, talk a little bit about, what, obviously, you, you think a lot of things at the Allen Institute. Um, when you spend time thinking about these types of scenarios, what, you know, what, what comes to mind as far as whether we're talking neuromorphic computing or as you say, uh, computers of a radically different design someday? Uh, what, what, what might happen down the line for us a century from now with regard to Conscious well, I worry about that. So I just returned from the Vatican last week speaking yeah. about the, the dangers of AI. And this is less, I mean, there's the obvious existential danger of AI, but I'm more concerned about a different danger. The danger that big tech is successful and big AI is successful and in 20, 30, 50 or whatever years will be surrounded by ubiquitous entities whether they be sex robots or um, assistance for the elderly, you know, companion for the el elderly, that we will automatically, because we have this very, we humans have this very powerful um, th uh, property called attribution. We very quickly attribute agency and sentience and consciousness. To, we will attribute consciousness to these creatures. Although I believe they will not feel like anything just like Alexa doesn't feel like anything. Yeah, Alexa is getting better and better at understanding us. And at some point, of course, you can ask Alexa or Siri, all these other, uh, you know, uh, uh, Siren voices, whether they're conscious or not, and they'll tell you, but it's all deep fake. Mm. And in fact, even if you make a perfect model of, the of a human brain and you simulate it, of course, this, this computer simulation will wake up one day and say, I'm conscious, but it's all deep fake. It's all behavior. And as you said, just like you can simulate gravity, you know, the, the, gra the gravity of the central um, star at the center of our galaxy, that's a black hole. You don't have to be afraid that your computer simulation has a causal power of a black hole and will suck you inside the computer simulation. Likewise, you, you can simulate the behavior associated with consciousness without those creatures being conscious. But because we attribute consciousness to them, it'll profoundly change our relationship, not only to, to these be, to the things, which is fine, that's just the false positive. So we, we impute consciousness when there isn't, but it's, it's gonna ultimately devalue humanity because the way we treat robots, whether they're sex bots or companions, which are ultimately nothing but machines, will also reflect the way we deal with humans. And ultimately, it'll lead to a profound dehumanization of what is unique about us, or about all biological creatures. So that's my worry. And that's the worry we spoke about at the Vatican. Got it. Um, a couple of months before that article, uh, October 20, 19 in Scientific American, you wrote uh, an article entitled, Is Death Reversible? And this is a fascinating article. You start off by going into the history of the definition of death as it has evolved from a, a pulmonary definition to a cardiopulmonary definition to, to brain death or irreversible coma. Uh, in the book, you talk about the um, severe disorders of consciousness that are sort of upstream from brain death in terms of persistent vegetative state and coma, minimally conscious states. Uh, and then you bring up two fascinating areas of research that are somewhat related. You, you talk about the uh, experiments that were done that year at Yale uh, in terms of the, the decapitated pig brains uh, and, and sort of reestablishing perfusion and, and looking at certain nests of, uh, of cells that are still alive several hours after death, not integrated, but uh, as you say, isoelectric. But um, And then you also talk about in this paper, the uh, Jahai McMath saga, which you know went on here for several years. Um, there were some 
prominent uh, neurointensivist, uh, Alan Schumann and Calisto Machado that sort of published uh, that they did not believe this was an actual case of brain death, but something kind of new in the very low end of the, the Glasgow coma score. Um, talk about what, talk about what were you trying to uh, get across in this paper? Because you, you, you touch on a lot, a lot of topics in it. What, what were you endeavoring to really, uh, the message to get across uh, in, in this particular Scientific American article? Well, I mean, I wanted to understand how we define death, which seems sort of, well, obviously, when a person's dead, it's dead, there's nothing more happening. But then, of course, like in anything, when you dig deeper, you find out it's actually quite complicated. So, A, as you point out, our evolution of what constitutes death has changed. So now a person that if you walk into an ER, you see their chest is moving up and down, their skin pallor is relatively normal, they look asleep but the doctor will tell you, I'm sorry, your loved one is dead, All right? So that's the current state uh, you know, of affairs. They're dead because their brain is dead and they're kept, uh, they're kept on ventilation because ultimately uh, in this case, they would act uh, with permission of next of kin, they would act as organ uh, donors. And so you wanna keep the organs suffused. So you know, it can benefit somebody else who doesn't have a, a heart or has a failing kidney. But, the, but that's a profound change in trying to explain that why that person is dead, although they look just peacefully asleep is, is challenging. What the Jahai McMath case says, that we need to, we have a less sophisticated understanding of death as Aristotle had more than 2,400 years ago. So he distinguished, he had this hierarchy of souls of increasing capability, he talked about the vegetative soul, the, the perceptive soul, the rational soul. The rational soul is the one that enables us to speak. Okay, and in these patients, it's clearly gone. The vegetative soul is the one that enables us to see, to hear, to perceive. That's really what we today, we moderns would call consciousness. That in these patients, in particular in her, uh, I believe the best evidence shows was also gone. But the, the vegetative soul, which is really the life principle, that wasn't gone. And she, although she was declared dead, you know, the, the, uh, in Oakland, she was in a hospital. There was um, something went amiss. She died on the operating table or uh, soon thereafter. The mother sued to, for the hospital to release her daughter. The ho hospital then released the legally corpse to her mother. The mother refused to accept that, moved to New Jersey with a religious exception, and the, the, the daughter was at home for four, and a half year, for four and a half years. She grew hair, she menstruated, she, her, she had a functioning immune system. Right, so ultimately, she did die of, of, um, of some complication. But here, so uh, using what definition of life and death can we see this person is dead when they still grow, right? When they still have a metabolism. So we have to learn to separate brain death from death of the body, which right now we are not. So, so the ongoing attempts, there's um, the Uniform Law Commission is looking into whether maybe, you know, our... Our definition of death that, that dates from the Uniform Determination of Death Act needs to be revised in the uh, in the light of this of um, of this further clinical evidence. But the, but the basic point is we have we may have to conceptually separate the death of the body from the death of 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 the brain or the absence of consciousness. So what you can say in many of these cases. The, the body may still be alive, albeit on a on a ventilator, but their consciousness has fled permanently. Mm -hmm. Your loved one will never breathe by themselves again. Your loved one will never be conscious again. So it doesn't feel like anything to be this person. The person has fled, even though the body may still be to a certain extent alive. Mm -hmm. And, and who knows what's going to come with future technology. As you pointed out, this, this study from Yale shows under certain conditions things are less irreversible. So again, death is defined by the irreversible laws of, brain fun of whole brain function. Well, what's irreversible today may not be irreversible tomorrow because irreversibility isn't a physical concept. It's really a, a technological. Given the current technology, this is irreversible. But maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, I can rever uh, reverse it. So it's sort of evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along those lines, I was just wondering, and if it's confidential, then obviously we don't have to talk about it. But um, there's been, you know, it's confidential uh, on your podcast. <laughs> um, right. The 
there's been this topic. I've seen some some uh, some papers around uh, this this topic of thanatotranscriptomics, which is people that are beginning to study, you know, a lot of these genes uh, that that sort of come alive or start expressing after death. Um, I was just, I mean, you, you talk a lot about single cell transcriptomics in your work at the Allen Institute. Do you, is there a field of neuro thanatotranscriptomics where you study sort of anything about gene expression after brain death to see sort of what, because I know in the in the body they've been finding out that, you know, there are a lot of embryonic genes and things like this that uh, for some reason are, are popping on following, uh, you no, know. No, as far as I know, not. I mean, no. one issue is that as soon as oxygen is cut off to the brain, the brain will start degenerating very quickly. No. So typically, um, the first time you as a scientist, after getting all the permission from next of kin, etc., have, even though, let's say, the person dies in a car accident, you try to get access to the brain within three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. By that time, many of these processes like transcription are already not working anymore because mm -hmm. the brain doesn't have power supplies. That's why yeah. if somebody chokes you within 10 seconds, you lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. And within uh, you know, 10 or 20 minutes, you get irreversible brain damage. That's why it's so important once you've, you know, to get to the uh, clinic, once your heart uh, stops beating. And so, yeah, I don't know anyone who studies sort of this uh, single cell transcription analysis many hours after brain death. Uh, I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> um, moving to uh, another area. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, your passions are neurons. Um, but I've had uh, another sort of Allen Institute uh, person on the show. So this is from the, the Allen Institute Frontier Group, uh, Mike Levin up at Tufts, uh, Allen Discovery Center up there. And I don't know if you follow his work that much, but he, yes. so Mike works with a lot of organisms that uh, either do not have brains or whose brains can be destroyed and regenerate and somehow you can have two brains or have two, two brains or multiple heads uh he also studies all of these what he terms these um uh, non-neural spiking tissues that uh, the heart bone pancreas uh, he studies schools of spermatozoa that communicate when they seek an egg not a lot of neurons here um what do, do you do a lot of work in these uh so i mean he always points out you know the nervous system came later uh and there are many organisms that don't have brains that you know use other t somatic tissues for this type of communication any interesting studies findings things that you work on in sort of parallel to to this type of work that um you know may give some clues as to some of the unknowns of how you know if you take that salamander's brain out uh, and it grows back how it knows things and all that other creepy stuff that he does <laughs> Well, I mean, one interesting question for me as a student of consciousness, to what extent does it, do you need a brain to, well, A, to what extent do you need a brain to, fe to feel like something? So one definition of an American philosopher, Thomas Nagel, is it feels like something to be conscious. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, if you don't have a brain, like some of these creatures, but you can act, you know, uh, you can still act in the world, uh, does it feel like something? And... The, the, the answer is it's quite possible. Certainly, according to integrated information theory, it may well feel like something, although much less than you and I. Um, another question is what happens if you have two heads, right, in one of these bodies? You know, you make one of these um, manipulations, you get a salamander or frog with, with, with two heads. Is there now two consciousness? We have the case in humans, very rare cases of, ident of twins, that due to development defect have a, have a so-called brain bridge. So they're linked at the level of the thalami, mm. right? If, and so here you have, I'm thinking of particular here, two girls, uh, they now must be like 14, 15, here in, uh, in Vancouver, in, in Canada, okay. and sort of the heads are grown together. They can't be separated surgically and their brain is bridged. They seem to be two separate individuals. But the question is what happens, for example, at night, do they always wake up together? Do they always go to sleep uh, together? Do they, are they then still two, uh, two separate entities? Can I imagine techniques whereby I call brain bridging again, whereby I can take your brain and my brain and do the inverse of a split brain. So you know what happens in a, cl in a classical split brain experiment, the neurosurgeon goes in and cuts, 
cuts essentially the brain along its midline to prevent seizures from, from spreading from the left to the right hemisphere. And you get as fast as we can tell two conscious entity in one skull, although typically only the left one, uh, uh, the left hemisphere is able to speak. What happens now if I do the inverse? If I take your brain and my brain and I start having sort of wires between two brain and my, um, your brain and my brain, IT predicts at some point, at a very discrete point, when I add enough neurons um, uh, um, or enough wires between my brain and your brain, the integrated information across our two brains will exceed that within your brain and my brain. At that point, instantaneous, your consciousness will be gone, my consciousness will be gone, and it will be replaced by a single Ira Christoph amalgamation. There will be a single mind that speaks through two brains, yeah. that you know can speak through two mouths but it's going to be a single conscious entity so you can imagine all sorts of interesting architectures where yeah. you have no brain or two brains or several brains but still you have, uh, but you might still have a conscious mind and some of these are experimentally accessible at least in the future with uh, with appropriate technology it's pretty cool i think it, it is pretty cool. And you got me thinking, I, um, about a year ago, I had the chance to, uh, to talk with um, uh, Dr. Zhizhang Zhao, and she was working down at DARPA uh, at the time on some fancy AI stuff. Uh, and at DARPA, you know, they kicked them out after five years. They get yeah. to do all sorts of neat yeah. research. And I asked her what she was going to do next. And the first thing she brought up was octopus. Uh, she thought the concept of the octopus, and you know this better than I, but the tentacles and the ganglion and all. Uh, so we're going from, from either no brains or multiple brains to weird brains now, and you have chapters on animal consciousness and, and, and multiple minds and so forth. Um, you, ever, you ever spend much, much time thinking about the octopus and other of its ilk and um, what no, consciousness? Except, in, um, except uh, no, I, I don't know too much about the octopus except the obvious. Um, but, but at least in principle, it's possible that you could have that you could have maybe you know this, this these distributed minds, right. you know, eight small minds that at times of danger come together to give rise to one mind if they can switch the architecture. Those things, at least in principle, are, um, are possible <laughs> and are testable. You can make the challenge is to make testable predictions based on a theory such as integrated information theory or other sure. theories of consciousness. Sure. And that's where we are now. We're now in a domain where we don't, where we have theories like IIT or another theories, global neuronal workspace, where we yep. can begin to make precise sort of predictions and then test them in, in the lab. And that we couldn't do until, you know, starting only a few decades ago. Scientific American, June 2020, Tales of the Dying Brain. And if I may read a little bit, uh, I accept the reality of these intensely felt experiences. They are as authentic as any other subjective feeling or perception. As a scientist, however, I operate under the hypothesis that all our thoughts, memories, percepts, and experiences are an ineluctable consequence of the natural causal powers of our brain rather than any supernatural ones. Uh, that premise has served science and its handmade and technology extremely well over the past few centuries centuries, unless there is an extraordinary compelling objective evidence. To the contrary, I see no reason to abandon this assumption. Uh, Christoph Koch. Um, Christoph, I, I had Sounds Bruce... Good. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it was a great art. Um, I had Bruce Grayson on the show about a year ago, and, you know, he talked all about uh, these out-of-body, near-death experiences, the feelings of tranquility, peace, of floating, and so forth. Um, but in his basket of stuff that he's looked at, there's a bunch of weird things too, like the people that leave the operating table and go down the hall to the cafeteria and see things there. Um, you know, hung out with Jim Tucker and all his kids that know things about past lives or stuff that they never experienced. Um, how do you, you know, once again, as you sit around pontificating about, <laughs> about the mind and consciousness, where do you put this? What I'll classify as the weird things. Uh, you can throw terminal lucidity in there. You can whatever you want to package in sort of the unexplainable or the, the questionable. How do you how do you look at these things, Krista? In each case, you look at what's the best evidence. So, for instance, these near death experiences. People used to think they were all crazy, but then it turns out they exist throughout time. Right? You can go back and play. Don't read one of them. Uh, they exist in the devout, uh, devout people can have them, non-devout people can have them, Muslim and Buddhist can have them, a Christian can have them, you can have them as an atheist, and their commonality, right? So if, uh, I had, I have had one year death experience, 
And it's, again, it shares the same phenomenology. There's this incredible bright point of life, and then there's nothing else. There's no body. Time is annihilated. Space is annihilated. The external world is completely gone, and you just have this feeling of terror and ecstasy. So you, you, you try to collect sort of common reports and analyze them sort of with using the wet blanket of reason, because that's the only thing we really we have, right? The, the wet blanket of, of reason. What are the commonalities? And if you do that, I think what remains at the end of the day that you still have you have a mind and you have a substrate uh, presumably in the in the brain and if the mind is ex if the brain disintegrates then the mind will also disintegrate all the other evidence for astral travel and you know reincarnation all of that is all you know I'm just extremely skeptical I had this discussion with this holiness the Dalai Lama we talked about the incarnation I said your holiness four words no brain, never mind. Okay, it's my core. No brain, never mind. Without having some brain there, there will not, you know, maybe even a future tech technological brain, but without having some physical substrate, there is no mind. There's, an, uh, I cannot conceive and I don't know how, how to conceive about it. Now, is my mind limited? Yes, I admit that, but I need to see a mechanism um, and for this to see. And look, we know the... We, we all want to, we all terrify to a larger or smaller extent by death. And so we invent, our mind invents all sorts of reasons to believe, you know, into all sorts of things, including the rapture, or it's more than equivalent, you know, the upload, right? And so people will invent all sorts of stories that they tell themselves to escape that, to, to escape that reality. And so one just has to be skeptical and see what is the hard evidence, for reincarnation, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or for future travel, you know, give me some real evidence. Can you travel in the future and give me the stock market? If you can do that consistently and become <laughs> immensely rich, then I'm willing to believe you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want sort of, you know, some evidence like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, there is a handful of cosmologists um, that spend their time thinking about what the cosmos is thinking about and making all sorts of uh, analogies between neural networks and similarities between what's out there. Um, what does IIT say about whether this cosmos uh, is thinking about something and whether it has some consciousness? Uh, on a grand well, scale. So, so this is a very old hypothesis, the anima mundi, right? the world soul. Right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a very ancient one. Uh, well, so according to IIT, in, in principle, it's possible that you have... Look, I'm conscious, the individual neurons are unconscious. They form, they form part of my overall conscious, but my, let's see, if I pick any one neuron in my brain, it's not conscious by itself. Right. So in principle, it's it's uh, nor are the atoms of, of my brain uh, conscious. It's a, uh, it's a brain at a particular level of spatial temporal granularity. So in principle, for any system, including the cosmos, you can ask, is there a maximum of causal effect power? Given the physics of it, I don't, in principle, it's possible. I don't see any evidence whatsoever for that, at least right now. Is it possible that the that the universe will evolve towards that? That is a uh, philosopher, mystic, um, uh, you know, um, Taylor de Chardin, you know, talks about the evolution of the of the cosmos towards towards what he calls the point omega. Maybe mm -hmm. it's going to happen in the future. I don't know. But right now, I'm conscious. You're conscious. My dog, who's here, is conscious. But uh, Gaia, for instance, you know, the Earth Gaia isn't mm -hmm. conscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least I've no evidence to suggest that she is or it is mm -hmm. um, Chris a final uh, final talking thinking point here going back to our discussion of Proust among the machines um, last year I, I spent some time with uh, Dr. Frank Marks who is the head of the hurricane uh, research center down at uh, NOAA uh, and you know he was talking about their supercomputer whatever they have back there to simulate all sorts of hurricanes and, and things but in Does addition what inside it well no here's the thing though <laughs> um down the hall or in some other location uh they have the hurricane machines now these are not the the hurricane machines of the the evil uh <laughs> the evil guy that wants to take over the world but these are the giant swimming pools that uh have all sorts of sensors and and oh, motors yeah. and things like that to create little hurricanes and so they can Feedback An stuff into computer, the, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think would happen if in twenty twenty, if, if in 
2200, we hooked up our neuromorphic computer to something that does simulate that event. Is it possible for a neuromorphic computer to learn <laughs> from its environment, a la your uh, chapter um, 11? Um, is it possible for a machine to learn from another machine if the architecture is correct <laughs> and learn about creating the Yeah, stars? I see no reason if you... But it, I mean, I wouldn't use the word... Well, it depends what you mean by simulation. The simulation today in 2021 means, you know, digital simulation on a right. programmable computer, right? So the way I understand you, this hurricane machine is actually emulating. It's like a wind tunnel, right? It's right. like a gigantic wind tunnel. So if it has the same scaling laws... And the same physical or similar physical causal power, then yes, this system will be conscious. There's nothing supernatural about the human brain. So were you to recreate the, 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 the human brain, your or my brain in a different medium, and it has the same causal power, yes, then you would get consciousness. No question about it. But, but the point is, and this really freaks out computer scientists, it's not a computation. So if you have, if, so here, let's say you take my iPhone, you know, in the future, when it's so much more powerful. You can run this. You can run code that will simulate what I say, right? In response to some question, but it's all simulation. You it, it, so IT says in order to to look for consciousness, you you cannot look at the input output. You have to look at where the where sort of the at the level of the metal. You have mm -hmm. to look at the causal power of the transistor of the current flowing onto the transistor gate and opening another gate, and you have to actually evaluate the causal power there. And given its radical different architectures from, from the way brains are wired with, you know, 50,000 input, 50,000 output massively overlap, you, you get very, very, very low cost of uh, power. So my phone is not going to be conscious, although it may be able to simulate me in, the, in you know, some distant future. So don't trust Alex when she says she's uh, Alexa or Siri when she says she's conscious. It's a deep fake. Okay. So it, it, it's uh, it's been fascinating uh, talking to you. Um, what, one last thing: any uh, I know you just got back from the Vatican. Um, what's what's hot uh, for 2022 that you can talk about? Conferences you're going to be at, uh, new initiatives at the Allen Center, and anything you want to mention, please. Well, I guess I mean the, the so in, in 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 the field of conscious study, there are two really big things now happening. One is the design of conscious meter that tells us in that that's being tested now in clinical centers, you know, to help identify which, for instance, vegetative state patients, you know, who are in a behavioral unresponsive state are actually unconscious mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus which one are, are conscious but are unable to properly respond because, you know, of their severity of the injury. And estimates is probably 20 to 30 percent of these people, uh, of these patients are probably misdiagnosed as mm -hmm. BS when in actually they are probably minimal conscious state. A. The other one is sort of these big advances in psychedelics, right? And, uh, you know, sure. psychedelics as expanding your consciousness or shrinking it under certain conditions. And there are a lot there, you know, more than 35 clinical trials that are running now. Uh, some of them may conclude in 23 or 24, which could, if they are positive, their outcomes for treatment resistant depression, et cetera, could lead to descheduling and really to a much more wide, wider appreciation or reappreciation that we had last 50 years ago to the potential benefits of these substances for, for living um, a content life. Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, for everybody that is going to be listening to this episode uh, across our podcast networks uh, or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Christoph Koch, Chief Scientist, MindScope Program, Allen Institute for Brain Science. Uh, pick up his book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Everywhere but Can't Be Computed. Actually, pick up all his books. Uh, he's an amazing guy. Uh, Christoph, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come talk to us. Thanks for everything you've been doing. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through everything you've been doing. It's a really wonderful story. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, this was a very wide-ranging uh, interview. It was fun.